And we are live. Welcome, mystery and thriller fans. I'm your on-air host, Sarah DeVello, and I am so excited to connect you with LA Times crime reporter IRL in real life turned thriller author James Queely, a.k.a. Jay Quizzical, here to give us the inside what? scoop on his brand new book, All These Ashes. James, welcome to Mystery and Thriller Mavens. Tell us about this book. That Instagram handle coming back to haunt me was not what I expected, but let's go. James, um, I told you I do research. You, come, you know what? I, I, I walked into that, deserved it. <laughs> I, I respect that jab out the gate. Uh, hi, I am Jay Quizzical, which is a stupid nickname from Newark that we might get into at some point. Um, my actual name is James Queely. I am the author of All These Ashes, which is the second novel in my Russell Avery series, which is basically not too divorced from my own life except for all of the punching that i don't do in actual reporting um but it's largely follows the story of russell avery who is a former reporter in newark new jersey uh former crime reporter at a fictional newspaper there he has been laid off and finds himself functioning with a kind of like a pi and name only really he's just doing favors for cops that are in trouble kind of almost acting as an investigator to help them out of internal affairs beefs he gets fed up with that and starts looking into issues of police misconduct, which tends to get him in uh, significant trouble with both uh, the police and the people thereafter. Uh, the second book largely follows him trying to unravel a cold case investigation where a police officer who was a previous rival of his in his reporter life is now under the impression that someone he arrested in this brutal cold case arson murder actually was innocent. And they're kind of in a race to clear his name before the man dies of a terminal illness. Whoa, James, you just took us on a roller coaster ride and I am here for it. I can't wait to get into every delicious detail. But first, we're already getting likes and hearts up from Facebook. Thanks, fam. Um, first, I just want to welcome everyone. If you're watching with us on Facebook, if you're watching on YouTube, my channels, Murder by the Books channels, Mystery and Thriller Mavens Facebook group, wherever you are, you're in the right place. This is the right time. If you've been here before, you know how it works. This is your time to ask this real-life crime reporter anything you want. Ask him about his beat. Ask him about his writing. Ask him about his book. Ask him about the difference between newspaper writing and book reporting. We're going to get uh, newspaper reporting and book writing. We're going to get into all of that and more. But this is your time. So get those questions going in the comments. I want to welcome Vicky Jean. I want to welcome Irma. I want to watch, welcome everyone watching on YouTube. Um, let us know what you would like to. Hey, Linda, good to have you. Um, let us know what you would like to ask. Now, James, this book is getting crazy good praise. S.A. Cosby raving. James Queerly takes the skills he has acquired as an award-winning journalist and puts them to devastating use as an author. Let's talk about that quote. Let's talk about um, how you put these these skills to devastating use. So first of all, uh, let's talk about the newspaper skills translating over to book writing, and then let's talk about the devastating use. How do you do that? Uh, mostly so I could finish a book because I, <laughs> I had tried to write. There is a there is a terrible version of a Newark novel uh, buried in a drawer somewhere in there from my early twenties. Uh, one of my colleagues at the uh, Star Ledger, who ironically went on to become Riley Sager, but this was back before uh, they got bitten by a radioactive thriller writer, um, you know, it kind of yelled at me, kind of just the obvious advice, write what you know, you know, the way I babbled as a night cop reporter, just the way I talked to people on the phone, you know, Riley thought that would be good, um, good fodder for narration. So I eventually stopped doing whatever it was I was trying to do with that other book and decided to write a reporter character. Um, and I think that's one of the things I generally, you know, kind of take advantage of writing is I, I get to, I meet crazy interesting people that otherwise you might not in another job. I have interviewed, you know, I've witnessed an autopsy. I've interviewed luchadors, you know, right after a match. Um, I've had more than a few run-ins with people on the wrong side of the law, uh, police officers that have done heroic things. I've interviewed police officers in mid-scandal. You know, you just come across a lot of the characters you want to put in these books and, I have, you know, enough, thankfully, just been fortunate between Newark and L.A., come across enough voices that you can come up with these believable characters. You come up with pastiches of sources you've made over the years and they they can become become compelling. So, yeah, it's almost like I get to pluck people out of reality, me transmutate them a little bit for my purposes. And you do, at least I think, hopefully create a kind of compelling world with rich and layered layered people. 
Ooh, a compelling world with rich, rich and layered people is a hashtag writer goals. So let's talk about how your writing skills, um, did, did your writing as a reporter help you write shorter, tighter, you know, did you, or did you, was that harder to have to, to, to create a hundred thousand words? I mean, what was that like to shift brains from reporter to thriller author? I think it's a double-edged sword. Um, I can, you will, I almost find myself more excited to write fiction than journalism sometimes not that I don't love my job not that I don't think it's super important but news writing is constrained it has to be you know pretty down the middle it has to be uh, you know I get yelled at sometimes for writing like purplish prose leads because you know the fiction brain takes over and bleeds back into the courtroom copy of the verdict story I'm doing that day um but you're you're not constrained in fiction and also I can curse more which I love to do and I'm going to do my best to not do here but four letter words are like half my vocabulary so I can do whatever I want prose wise with that. Um, the other side of it is I am so uh, obnoxious about fact checking in real life that I sometimes don't let my imagination run wild in the crime fiction. I think my books to some extent benefit from their authenticity, but I also will, I have had, you know, both of these novels, uh, the lovely Jason Pinter and Paulus has had to chop out, you know, me explaining exactly how a probationary hearing would work or, why this piece of information would be in a prelim transcript and she's like people people don't care about that like you're not doing you're not actually you're, you're only a court reporter from nine to five like cut it out now so it so it, it helps and it hinders but i think it helps more but there's definitely there's still there's still ways you trip uh you are getting people uh, laughing already at your fondness for four letter words james <laughs> i love it and feel free to drop them margaret Pernod hello. saying hello james <laughs> queely margaret joining us live from the pacific northwest margaret welcome to the conversation always a pleasure to have you leslie saying hello from canada that's her signature canadian hello brings me so much joy leslie always a pleasure to have you margaret saying um oh melissa saying hi james and sarah so happy to join you live. Melissa, welcome from Australia. Thrilled to have you as always. Thank you for joining the conversation. Margaret saying she would love to hear about the difference in craziness from reporting uh, writing life versus craziness from novelist writing life. Let's hear some of these crazy stories, James Queely. Uh, oh, so you want a crazy reporting story? I mean, yeah, I guess. Give, I us, guess it's give us one of each. Give us some. Give us some yummy, tasty tidbits from both of your lives. Uh, so I did make a joke about n Russell gets in dust ups a lot more than I do at work, but I did get punched out on one of my first crime scenes in Newark back when I was a child. Uh, not a literal child. I was like 21, but that's for reporter purposes. I might as well have been an infant. Um, so I get called out to the scene of a double shooting midday. I'm just following a scanner report. I don't really know what's going on. And this is before, you know, I, I think I was basically a post-grad intern, so I was still showing up in, like, suits almost to work every day, which uh, not how it works when you do actual journalism in the actual street. So I walk up to the scene. Cops aren't talking to me. I don't have any sources yet. I don't really know what's going on, but the crowd is agitated. I can't see. I'm assuming this is, you know, like a double homicide. This is something tragic. And just somebody is near the, um, the, the, the police tape. And they just start yelling at me. I was working for the New York Star Ledger at the time. That was the paper I was at previously. They just start yelling, Star Ledger, what you got? And I'm like, I don't, what, what does that mean? I don't know what you're saying. I, I'm holding the notepad. I'm like, you asking what happened? And he goes, Star Ledger, what you got? And I'm smelling a little midday sauce coming off this guy. Um, but I can't, you know, he keeps doing this and doing this and like shoulder bumping me. And I don't really know what's going on, but I'm trying to ignore him. Um, and some woman starts running out of the crime scene, like screaming that she saw everything. And I'm like, oh, great. For, I'm trying to get her attention. She's pushing past the cops. I think I'm going to get this great interview. And I hear him yell again. He goes, Star Ledger, what you? And he's like, what you guys? Screaming in the back of my head. I turn around and I go, what? And just, just right, on, right on the nose. Down I go. Down he goes. What? Yeah, he passed out. He was wasted, clocked me, and went down. Um, I lose the woman who I think is my great source. I'm finally like fed up. I leave. Um <laughs> Because I'm just like, the hell with this. Um, half hour <laughs> later, I find out this was a, still sad, but not terribly newsworthy. It was a double shooting of two dogs that a dealer loosed on the Newark cops responding to a scene. So awful, huge dog person, not happy about that, but also not exactly the biggest story in the world. So <laughs> I got, I, I literally got punched in the face for sticking my nose where it didn't belong. And on top of that, I didn't get a story out of it.
Oh my God, that James, what a crazy, but yet you, 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 nevertheless, he persisted in his life of crime reporting. Um, and you know, like, I've written about like proud boys and crazy people since then and never gotten swung on, but the drunk guy in Newark is the only one to land a shot on me in an 11 year career. That's well, lesson number one don't go to Newark. I mean, I think we, we've solved this mystery. <laughs> I will dispute that, but anyway. <laughs> I'll fly out of Newark, but that is it. Uh, Melissa Watson laughing along with us. Margaret saying four letter words are half of your vocabulary. Where are you from again? James joining us from the from the great city of Brooklyn. Don't show up in a suit. Noted. I know because I feel like I watch Law and Order. I'm like, oh, everybody wears a suit like that. I would. I also would would show up um, in a suit. Uh, Margaret saying so. Apparently, reporting is a contact sport. So, it, have you had any other crazy interactions like this? Have you ever had to dish out the uh, the punches, James? No, mercifully. Um... It's, I mean, I'm, I'm joking about the Newark thing, and that was objectively funny. Like, I didn't really get hurt. Um, <laughs> I've gotten, I've, I've definitely got, definitely gotten like fights in grade school worse than that. But, um, uh, no, I mean, now, unfortunately, you know, there's a lot more heated rhetoric towards the press. I've covered a couple of, uh, you know, protests against vaccine mandates lately, some involving more like far right fringe groups, a lot of protests where, People are not happy with what we're they, we're doing. I had a friend from NPR uh, get swung at a little bit at a protest a few months ago out here. Um, I've had a few instances covering protests with uh, you know the the people that do kind of the anti-fascist stuff. They're wrapped up in, in black clothing. They get very mad when you film them in public. And while they have not been as violent towards me as the other side, they do often threaten to break cameras. Um, it's not. It's not fun. I mean, it, well, I, mean not, I still love my job, but it's not, you know, it's definitely a lot more head on a swivel, protect yourself. We're having a lot more conversations about how to defend yourself, frankly, on assignment than you maybe were five, 10 years ago. Nobody, nobody was talking about, about this possibility when my career started anyway, or not as much. Wow. That is really crazy to have to think that um, as a member of the fourth estate, you now have to also uh, take self-defense classes or be aware. I mean, that's that's a whole new way of thinking. How bizarre. Um, Kathy saying hello there from Dallas slash Fort Worth. Kathy, welcome to the conversation. Great to have you back. She was, says, James, do you ever find yourself thinking as a reporter, this is better than fiction. No one's going to believe me. Yeah, that, that happens from time to time. People just engage in, in stupidity you wouldn't suspect. Uh, I'm trying to think what's what's an insane, like I didn't, even want to pitch my editor um, <laughs> kind of lunatic story lately. Um, Almost like an onion like story where you're, where you think this couldn't possibly be real life, but yeah. Yeah. The thing is like, it's usually not funny though. <laughs> Fortunately, <laughs> given, given my beat, um, let me circle back on that. Let's but, circle back. Kathy, we're going to come back. That's a good juicy I question. I definitely got a good answer for that. I just got to pluck it out. So you got to pluck it out. You've got you've got to close some other tabs. We'll come back to it. Mm -hmm. Melissa would like to know, how do you know that your sources are correct? Great question, Melissa. James, you said you're a thorough, uh, obsessive researcher even. Let's talk about that. Mostly omnipotence. It's like <laughs> um, No, no, no. Uh, I mean, yeah, you don't. Whenever you see something in a story that's, you know, a person with knowledge of or a law enforcement official with knowledge, or one of those, you know, anonymous source things, like they're not, you know, like fairies we find that just fly in through the window and give us information. Um, it's usually somebody enmeshed in an agency you cover or somebody else involved in a court proceeding. It's, it's you, you would have to, you, you, you would corroborate their information against other accounts, what, you know, match as much of it as you can to a public record or a lawsuit or, um, uh, you know, any kind of other, you know, other, other reporting on the topic. You you want to make sure their details match up with other objective, unimpeachable pieces of information. It's not just like, you know, somebody whispers in your ear, oh, the 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 mayor, you know, has a jetpack and is going to use it to burn the city down or something. Um, you try, I don't know why I'm, yeah, I'm a huge comic book nerd, by the way. So if my references are just getting absurd, that's why. Um but yeah, you don't, you, you never, you, you tend to never take anything at face value. Also, you know, when you say, you say it's a good thing you said sources, plural, uh, general rule, you will never print, you will almost never print anything from just one anonymous person, you know, or one anonymous, whatever it is. It'll be two or three. You, you, you match it up. You make sure you're not just, it's, it's not coming from, or you avoid the term echo chamber. You make sure it's not all coming from the same agency or the same police unit. You know, you, you try to make sure 
it's coming from so many places that it can't have been a kind of a coordinated leak to you. A coordinated leak. Okay, interesting. Um, Melissa, thank you for the question. James, thanks for the insights. Um, Margaret saying she now wants to see crime fiction written by someone who talks with fairies. James, can we count on a fairy <laughs> whisperer in your next book? Uh, I have a weakness for like horror noir sometimes or like uh, high fantasy that kind of crosses into crime. So if if and when I get around to trying to blend those two genres, uh, I will I will pin that back for them. <laughs> Excellent. Melissa said that must take some time, yet time is of the essence to get the story out. Yeah. How does that work? I have this idea that, you know, the clock is ticking and your fingers are typing as fast as you can uh, to make deadline. How does that work, James? Well, that happens. I mean, there are a lot of times something breaks. It's a, you know, any kind of like natural disaster, horrible, violent crime, uh, God forbid, kind of mass shooting situation, which we find ourselves covering. Yeah, that's go, go, go. You know, obviously, you want it to be as accurate as humanly possible, but you don't have as many time, much much time to breathe, and you know, put it, do as much as much in depth fact checking as you might on a longer term story. But a lot of the big investigative projects I do, they can take the better part of uh, six months to a year. Um, I have a I have something coming out this week um, that I'll just just keep an eye out on Twitter or the LA Times website by about Wednesday. Let's say I don't really want to tip my hand beyond that. But I've been hunting that down probably since August. A um, couple of things I won awards for or was nominated for awards for last year, like data projects, are a lot of what I do looking at, um, you know, a DA's filing rates or police misconduct stats or what have you. That stuff takes the better part of a year because math is hard and I'm a writer, um, <laughs> which is why Ben Poston, if you're listening, does all my math for me. Um, but, uh, I, you know, I, I do the back of the envelope crime data now. But once we got to start doing, you know, formulas and quadratic equations and nonsense, that's his problem. Um, but uh, but yeah, it, it, can, it can vary. Like you said, that, that, that whole like, oh, my God, the clock is ticking. Everything's on fire. That happens a lot. But yeah. the, the big projects, usually that those will take months to the better part of 12 months. Oh, wow. OK. I did not know that. Uh, Kathy's saying omnipotence as a source. I would have loved that when I was a reporter. LOL. Yes, James, we will be looking forward to to seeing you cite your um, your your the, your incredible source uh, abilities for to in your in your future acknowledgments. I'd like to thank me for my omnipotence might be a good lead in for your acknowledgments. Um, Margaret saying great common sense on sources opinions on the new verb both sides -ing. Is that a hard line to define? I generally still kind of identify as like the balls and strikes kind of reporter. I often use referee as the analogy for what we do, but that's the both sides thing. I think it oversimplifies things, but it's also not an entirely wrong headed criticism. You know, this is something that really in the past four years, I think reporters have gotten more comfortable with just saying a source or a person or an administration or whatever you're covering is lying in a story or that they've claimed something without evidence, which I think five or 10 years ago, it used to just be like, the Republican said this and the Democrat said this, or the prosecutor said this and the defense attorney said this. And sometimes any of those parties might say something and they provide nothing to back it up. And if it's an outrageous claim, you can't just give it air. You have to point out that, you know, they they said the painting was stolen, but the painting was still there. Um, <laughs> but no, but I mean, it's a simple analogy, but it often gets brought up. You know, as a reporter, your job is 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 not to tell me whether or not it's raining. It's to it's to put your hand out the window and figure out which is true. Um, or mm. I butchered that, but that there is a version of that that exists. Um, but, but yeah, uh, I, I do think there is, there has been some of the, the, the general criticism that follows the term both sides thing uh, is valid. I don't, I don't, you know, I, I try to stay as down the middle as possible. There is sometimes when one of the two, two sides or three sides or four sides of a story you're involved with is engaging in horse shit. And you need to point that out. And just so we're all clear, both sides thing is even when the story is ludicrous telling both sides of it. Yeah. Generally, it, uh, both sides, like a good example of this would be something like climate change, right? It's it's okay. giving air to, or, or anything that's a hoax. It's giving air to people whose side of the story is completely divorced from reality or is just totally destroyed by scientific evidence. Um, it's not the same as, you know, if there's a, it, like it wouldn't apply to say, or it largely wouldn't apply to like a, a debate over a piece of legislation, again, unless one side is completely engaging in, in fiction. 
Got it. Got it. Thank you, Margaret, for the great question. James, thanks for the um, the, the right there in the midst of this um, opinion from uh, from your daily life of, of having to deal with this. This is a fascinating perspective. Um, thank you both for that. Welcome, Melinda. Welcome, Olean. Welcome, Jennifer. Welcome, Robert. Karen, great to have you all. Thank you. Um, I especially liked Math is Hard and I'm a Writer. Uh, thank you for that quote. Oh, I, 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 I also do not excel at the maths. Um, Margaret is saying, is giving, is is clapping for that answer. So thank you for that. Olean is saying, uh, is sending, oh, hey. is sharing an article. Olean, it's so great to have you here. Thank you for that review. That was amazing. Yay, everybody. <laughs> Oline is a, a book, re book reviewer for the Sun Sentinel, and she is sharing uh, her review with us here. So everybody check that out, and I will post it later in the Mystery and Thriller Maven's Facebook group as well. Um, so Oline, thank you for that. This is so great. Um, James, you're getting tons of great reviews. Publishers Weekly awarding you a starred review, raving outstanding. Queerly gets all the details right while populating the plot with believable characters. Let's talk about how you create those believable characters. What do you do? You credit your time on the job with meeting such a diverse array of people? I mean, what's your secret? How do you do it? My, my favorite game with these two books has been hearing from old sources in Newark and figuring out, A, <laughs> if, they, if they know which one of the characters they are a piece of, and B, when they get it wrong. Um, <laughs> I, 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 I was very fortunate to meet a lot of people who taught me a lot about the universe when I got to Newark. You know, I was, I, I was, I was raised by a police officer, and that is a very helpful perspective for me to have in my life and in my reporting, but it also, you know, makes you look at the world one particular way. Being in Newark, being around members of the Black Panther Party, uh, council people who had grown up uh, having a very different experience with the police than I did kind of, you know, broadened my view. I wouldn't say it pushed me all the way the other direction either, but it certainly swung me out of a kind of cops and robbers worldview that I had growing up. Um, there are, yeah, there are, Russell obviously does not have a ton of distance from me, um, but some of the other characters... They're definitely, you know, amalgamations of cop sources or detectives I knew among the law enforcement. Uh, a lot of people's favorite character across the two books is uh, is Kiana Jackson, who is uh, most anybody from Newark who knows me or who followed my reporting a couple of years ago will know who that is. Um, you know, other other and as as we got into the second book, you know, that was written well by the time I was fully enmeshed out here. Uh, that also I will sometimes pluck people I met in LA and kind of turn them into, you know, it's never, it's never a one for one. It's never like detective whoever in real life is detective whoever in the book. Um, but I will usually take a piece of, you know, if somebody has a certain manner of speaking or a couple of phrases, I know they always use, I might borrow that or inject that into a person or if somebody else has, you know, I, I'll borrow pieces of maybe somebody's background as to how they became an activist or a prosecutor or, or whatnot. So I mean, the, you know, what's that phrase? Good writers steal uh, or great writers steal. Um, I just happen to, to I, I would say, liberally borrow from reality. <laughs> I liberally borrow from reality. I think that 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 that's a great quote if ever I have ever I have heard one. Um, and thank you for that um, inside scoop on how you do create these characters. Um, which Publishers Weekly is praising. Booklist also awarded you a star review, saying Queely himself, a crime reporter for a former crime reporter for the Star Ledger in New Jersey, brings both reporting expertise and novelistic flair to the second Avery mystery, absorbing throughout. Congratulations on that starred review. Uh, let's talk about the novelistic flair. When how, how do you do it, and when do you deploy it? When is it too much? Did you, did your uh, did your fearless editor Jason Pinter have to reel you in. Um, give us the scoop on that. I think he was, he was, I, there were, I believe there was less of, uh, sometimes he calms down. Russell can talk way too much, which is my own <laughs> disease. Um, I have, I think that goes back to what, some of what you were saying before, right? About the getting, having the, the shackles taken off from the writing style, from journalism to, um, to fiction. I definitely get into, you know, I have a lot to say and I'm just going to say it mode or what is that? You know, what's, what's the Seinfeld Festivus thing, right? Like, uh, you know, I, the, the airing of grievances, like sometimes I get a little bit too into that in in fiction. Um, but yeah, it also, um, 
I think I have a almost I, I I listen to a lot more music writing the second book than the first one. Um, and I think there's a bit more of a, like a lyricism to my writing that might have been there before. Um, I, I used to I think the first book was was no music. The second one was a mix of kind of calmer, more like atmospheric, maybe non lyrical stuff in the background for the calmer scenes. And then the action scenes was a ton of hip hop. So I think that kind of braggadocio approach, especially there's a lot, a lot of run the jewels with this record for uh, friends of mine who know me. So uh, kill, kill, Killer Mike and my reporter character both tend to talk a lot of shit. So that would uh, explain something. Um, but yeah, I mean, and it, it, it all falls down to the, the action sequences. I tend to just kind of focus on, you know, short, short bursts. That's where I kind of tra transition. I think the journalism helps. It's just, this is happening. This is happening. This is happening. You don't stop to stare at like and wonder what that like bent beam in the ceiling warehouse ceiling or whatever might might mean like you just kind of i just kind of get to that um almost like don't think just just right kind of mode when when in some of the tenser action sequences especially in the back side of the book Ooh, interesting how listening to music the, both listening to it at all versus writing in silence could impact your writing and also the kind of music um, as I, I will be, I will be now reading the rest of this with that in mind, wondering if I can match the songs to that, to that mode, James. Um, Margaret is saying she just visited your website. What a great bio, a poser hitman who never actually killed anyone. It makes me think of Lawrence Block. Um, does he get a place among your favorites? Uh, Lawrence Block or the, or the story you're referencing? Um, let's go with both. Let's start with Lawrence yeah. Block. Well, just, yeah, uh, 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 no, no, dis no disrespect, but he's not one of my go-tos. Um, usually, a uh, big Michael Connolly fan, which has obviously been a huge honor that he has become a fan of my work. Um, Jonathan Lethem was actually probably who got me big into crime fiction. I was a uh, mother. I think I read Motherless Brooklyn when I was sixteen, which I probably shouldn't have been reading at that age. Um, but that pulled me in a lot. Big Dennis Lehane guy. Um, more recent authors, uh, Julia Dahl writes a reporter series, uh, or she did write a reporter series. She's now moved on to other things, but the Rebecca Roberts character definitely had some influence on um, Russell. Uh, also, uh, I, I might have mentioned this before, I'm a big comic book guy. Uh, so a lot of the uh, the Daredevil comics when I was in high school, because they're very crime oriented, there's a significant journalism character in those Marvel comics named Ben Urich. Uh, that stuff uh, gets on me a lot. Uh, I sometimes some think, uh, the way I narrate the almost kind of like sarcastic rapid fire quippiness, it looks a lot like the little yellow boxes you might see in a Spider-Man comic. So that that also uh, plays over. <laughs> I love it. Julia Dell came on the show when uh, the Forgotten Hours came out. She's amazing. What a brilliant, um, insightful, incisive book. Um, absolutely loved it. So great to hear that you are a fan. Margaret is also sharing uh, sharing your website. Everybody check it out. The link is in the comments. Margaret, thank you for posting that. Um, just making sure I'm not missing anybody here scrolling through all the comments. Thank you, everybody. And yes, indeed. So very cool. Um, oh, speaking of Julia Dahl, let me share her blurb from this book. She is raving that it is an elegant, fierce, and totally gripping thriller. Queely is one of the most exciting voices in crime fiction. High praise there from Julia Dahl, James. Um, congratulations on that. Margaret saying she's laughing and loving the envisioning the witty banter as speech bubbles in the comics. I know now I'm that's so that is so visual. I can actually see them as well as well, Margaret. Um, Leslie saying she immediately thought of Peter Parker. Yeah, um, there, there is a Spider-Man reference not that well hidden in each book. Um, that probably <laughs> will continue to be a thing as long as I'm writing fiction. So we can look forward to a Spider-Man or any hero. Probably, I think I'll I think I'll keep it keep it on task with that one because if I start if you start letting me go deep cut uh, comic references everyone's gonna stop listening so I'll just keep it tidy. <laughs> um. Oh my gosh, look at Leslie, you're picking up what James is putting down. You two are vibing because you're on that Spider Man wavelength, y'all. I want to remind you to get your copy of all these ashes tonight. I'm plopping the link 
in the comments. So click over and grab it and buy this book from a woman-owned independent bookstore tonight, Murder by the Book, your source for all the best books and all the best interviews, not just mine. They do amazing interviews too. Um, so go ahead and grab a copy of all these ushers. Clearly, James is going to make you laugh. It's going to keep you entertained. And now we've all got to find that Spider-Man reference in every single book. In fact, let's find it and then we can tweet it at him. Um, so go ahead and grab your copy. Now I want to share a couple more reviews. Library journal raving intricately plotted fans of Brad Parks's Carter Ross crime series also set in Newark will appreciate Queely's latest story featuring reporter turned investigator Avery. Let's talk about the plotting. How did you achieve this intricate plot did you are you a plotter are you a pantser do you write it out on big post-it notes what's what give us the give us the skinny i'm an outliner um also good use of give us the skinny nobody uses that phrase anymore around me and i'm super happy to hear it um <laughs> uh this so both I, I i am i'm an outliner um sometimes to nauseating detail i will at least lay out um every every scene of every chapter i usually have a paragraph or two paragraph summary for myself so i don't lose my place most of my characters have decent bios probably more than i ever need but i just want them to have like a little bit of a semblance of an inner life before i start getting into them this way i if for argument's sake i need to know what uh bill henneman who's the, the police lieutenant that russ is in a uh strange bedfellows partnership with for most of this book if i need to know you know there's a reference to him really liking bruce springsteen at some point and like that's something i just plucked out of the note file it was like on a random wheel of like what would this older cop listen to while we're driving to asbury park obviously i gotta make a bruce joke here um uh, yeah, but I'm not I'm not a pantser because I go crazy. I almost became one for this book because I had a nightmare scenario. Uh, Line of Sight came out in March 2020, and I was home right before the pandemic began. I was doing launch events in New York, and the third night, the last event I did was actually with Julia Dahl, ironically. Everything is coming together here. We're in the singularity. Um, and de Blasio shut the city down like during my event. So I'm racing to get back to, to LA. Not sure, you know, at that point, we didn't know they were going to shut down domestic air travel. And I left my laptop at the security checkpoint in Newark airport and I hadn't backed up my files in a week. So at that point we had just pitched, I think we had just, we had just pitched all these ashes to Paul's. We hadn't sold it yet. Uh, I thank God had the first 10,000 words of the novel backed up in a, in a PDF somewhere else, but I lost my entire outline. Oh my God. You like, never got it back? No. So, so, oh. No, no. TSA did not find it. So either someone walked off with it or someone decided, oh, this is a Dell. It's a piece of garbage and threw it out. Um, <laughs> but, um, it was an old Dell. I am the least tech savvy 34 uh, year old on earth. But, um, <laughs> so I had to re I had to re outline the book and I'm pretty sure the plot changed as a result because I just couldn't remember how a lot of stuff worked in the second. Like I knew the ending. Mm -hmm. I knew who did what. I knew the general and the, 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 the story, this, uh, this you've mentioned Law and Order before, the story, the main story, the main uh, homicide is a transmutation of a pretty infamous and horrible uh, Newark murder. So that obviously I had to pull from. I had reported on that while I was at the ledger. But the middle of the book, I kind of just forgot what happened. So I had to re-crack that, which um, uh, sucked. There's really not an artful way to say it. I just, I feel bad for my fiance. I was going relatively insane uh, for about a month there trying to figure out like what the hell happened here. So what happened? You had to rewrite it from from memory, this 10,000 word thing after you left it at the TSA well, security? No, th thankfully, I had the beginning of the book saved. Like the first the first few chapters of the book that are, are more or less the same in there. That was fine. But my... My, my plot map from there, especially like the second act of the book, I really didn't remember what happened. So I had to, um, yeah, I kind of replotted that. I think some things changed. I think they changed for the better, but I'm not really, I'm almost curious if I could ever find that, that file, if it's backed up in an email somewhere, like how we got from point A to point B to point C originally. James, this is literally one of my nightmares. So I have drop, I have, I have backups on Dropbox. I have yeah. backups on Google Drive. I have backups on my hard drive. Then I email it to myself once a week just to be extra, extra OCD because it is literally my nightmare to lose my work. In stark contrast to me and apparently you, uh, Lauren Groff uh, once 
I read an interview by her and she said she writes the entire book out. This is hard to believe, but she writes the entire book out. Then she deletes it and rewrites it from memory, claiming <laughs> that face yeah. is exactly how I no, feel. No, 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 no. <laughs> saying her uh, claiming that um whatever her memory retains is what is important enough to be in it i i i start sweating when i think of that um i'm like reaching for the liquor cabinet right <laughs> now, hearing this i mean that's amazing if that works for her i would never you know question anybody's yeah. process but uh no i would not that would not end well for me yeah <laughs> good on you lauren Groff. I'll be over here with my five safe drafts. <laughs> um, Melissa is saying, I am sure your book is a fast thrill ride. Must get my hands on it. Absolutely, Melissa. And then you need to read the first one. So I'm going to plop that one in the link as a uh, plop the link to that as well. So, or should they be read in order, James? They both function standalone. Um, there are the, what happens in the first book kind of creates the position Russell is in at the start of the second and the position some of the other characters. There's a political subplot, parallel plot. All, all of that is engineered by the first book. You don't need to know it to follow it, but it will probably give away the game of the first one if you read all these ashes first. So it really, you, you, there's, there's plenty to find in line of sight that isn't just the like the whodunit aspect of it, but you're probably going to know who done it if you read all these. I don't think I ever name the the killer i guess for lack of a better term by name in line of sight in all these ashes but like you, your suspect list is going to narrow real i can't snap my camera <laughs> just pretend i did that your son your your uh, suspect is going to narrow real fast if you read the second one first okay perfect so here's a plan everybody grab james's first book here yeah. and then <laughs> of the second or treat yourself it's the holiday season give the gift of a great read to your favorite uh, to the to the favorite reader in your life or to yourself i'm all about what <laughs> gift others and gift yourself uh kathy is saying nope nope and double nope on the deleting the deleting the entire draft and typing from memory kathy amen um Melissa is saying, yes, she will scoop up that first book. Melissa, the first mm -hmm. book is Line of Sight. So I'm going to go ahead. Um, the, I'm going to plot these. But, so the first one is The Line of Sight. And the most recent one is All These Ashes. So read them in order. Gift yourself. Gift the mystery and thriller fan in your life. You are going to want to read both of these. Trust me. Um, we would need to get our hands on these books. So I'm, po I'm plopping both the links to the first book and the second book right here so you can grab them. Um, James, thank you. Oh, Melissa is giving us a thumbs up. Yay. Melissa, get your hands on. And then let us know what you think about it. We always debrief later uh, on all of our reads. So James, I may circle back with any, with any, with any, uh, with, with, with both constructive criticism and, uh, and praise. People are laughing on Facebook. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm sure it's all praise. Um, James, anything that, um, oh, speaking of Michael Connolly, your fan, your, uh, who's, who you said you are a fan of and who has since become your fan, he raves of your first book, um, line of sight signals the start of a great career veteran, veteran journalist, James Quilly brings all his insider knowledge of the intersections of crime and police and politics and media in a story that never stands still for a single page. I'm going to pop that up briefly because James being very mysterious, we can only, we can only see his mysterious eyes. <laughs> um, Michael Connolly, number one, New York Times bestselling author of the Harry Bosch series. High praise to um, what an incredible experience that must be from being his fan to have him raving about yours. Tell us about that moment when you received that reveal. Uh, yeah, I've, I've had the, the good fortune of interacting with Michael a few times over the past few years and each one was, yeah, just kind of stunning to hear him say anything nice about me because he's basically the grandmaster of modern detective fiction. Um, I actually met him a few years earlier. Uh, somehow I ended up on a BAFTA panel, like the British uh, uh, Academy of Film and TV. Or oh, interesting. Let's pretend I got that acronym right. I was close. I was like 80% there. Um, and yeah, we ended up pretty much on a stage together answering questions from film students. This is before I even published my first book. They just wanted a journalist there. And yeah, he actually, um, you know, nothing, he had better things to do probably, but he actually stuck around and like kind of talked me through. I kind of just had to pull him aside. I was like, I'm trying to write novels. I work at the LA Times. You pulled this off, you know, 20, 30 years ago. Like how, 
because you mentioned like switching, switching. Yeah. It took me a while to figure out how to sw- like turn that switch. It's like, okay, it's six o'clock. I'm done with journalism. Let me eat dinner or go work out or whatever, and then start writing fiction. He kind of talked me through what motivated him to to get out of that. And yeah, he's been he's always been very very open with advice and generous with praise in his time. Um, and I've always really appreciated that. I mean, I'm a, obviously been a huge fan of the Bosch books, just like most of the rest of the world who reads this genre. Uh, I also have a weakness for his Jack McAvoy character because you know, journalists, you're going to like your own. So <laughs> him. To see to see him have a have a positive reaction for a book that I you know hell I didn't know if it was ever going to get published two three four years ago whenever I started writing it um, that was uh, that's still it's still weird to be saying this out loud right now that like it's like I'm just it sounds like I'm making this up as I go along it's like no that happened like, sure really did so happened. even as a, an award winning journalist it still feels surreal and exciting it's surreal it's exciting and it's still nerve inducing. You know, I wasn't, I, I was convinced the second book was awful. Uh, I feel like a lot of writers think that, you know, they say the, Oh, the curse of the sophomore the or whatever. Thing. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. I was, when I turned in the first draft of that, I was like, well, this sucks. Hopefully Jason likes me. And apparently I was wrong. <laughs> about the first part, I think he likes me. Um, but yeah. So, so my, yeah, getting praise from Michael, getting praise from somebody from like somebody like Sean Cosby, who I've looked up to for a minute, you know, um, blacktop wasteland was amazing. A year ago, his first book, My Darkest Prayer, is over his first crime novel. Razor is Blade year. Tears, yeah. Razor Blade yeah. Tears is great. Yeah, I figured I figured that one is that the hype train has left the station on that one. So <laughs> I just went back further in the uh in the, the hype the, train. The, the um, oh my goodness. Yeah, all these my- people that I've looked up to with the praise has been just it's been phenomenal and I can't thank them enough. Yay, Mike O'Neill. Welcome to the conversation. Always a pleasure to have you, sir. Chiming in saying Jason Pinter is great. Jason Pinter is great. He's been on the show twice for his books. Um, and 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 he is always such a great guest and a great guy. Um, so good to know that you've had a good experience with him as your editor. Mike, great to have you as well. Um, well, y'all, it looks like we have time for about one or two more questions. We're almost out of time, but I bet I can, we can fit more one or one or two more in for the speed round. So get those questions going. Um, meanwhile, I will ask James, what do you want people to leave your books? You know, learning, feeling, having experience, what do you want them to walk away from your pages? With. Uh, I think it's, uh, you know, the, the understatement of the year is we live in polarizing times. Um, and I write normally about groups that are constantly in conflict, be it law enforcement, the media, uh, criminal justice reform activists, people that are, you know, on the wrong side of the law, but maybe trying to do better. These are groups that normally don't understand each other. You know, a lot of criticism I hear about press comes from a place, it seems more of ignorance than actual frustration. And I don't mean that in an insulting way, but more, you just don't know how it works. I find that often I, I every every day I make assumptions about policing that I'm wrong about or I make assumptions about defense work that I'm wrong about. I might make assumptions about about people that have, you know, defendants in cases that I'm wrong about. You know, there's just there's a lot of there's a lot of entangled um, you know conflict between these groups and a lot of people just judging groups instead of individuals. And I, I you know, one of the, the best pieces of praise I felt like I got for line of sight wasn't I love the star reviews and I'm super glad that Michael Connolly loved my work, but it was a it was a law enforcement officer who shall remain nameless, but you know somebody who pretty much read it and was like, you know, they had a much different opinion of protesters of groups like Black Lives Matter before, and they'd never really thought about what it was like being on the other end of a gun and a badge. And like this person certainly did not suddenly you know retire from policing or anything, nor would that have been my aim. But it at least opened up their worldview of a group that they otherwise had an antagonistic relationship with. And I sometimes hear that going the other direction as well. And maybe that's just the reporter in me that we try to, like I said, referring to us as referees, but I just hope if you're, if you are, if you go into these books and you have a really steeply negative opinion of one of the, the main groups in that intersection that gets talked about, right? Police, media, protesters, what have you. I just hope you know that I'm general, what I'm pouring into those characters is from my, real lived experience with those groups. And I hope it maybe just makes you look at them in a slightly different light. You don't have to like them, but maybe you try to understand them a little better because that's kind of what I think makes the books work is I don't, I'm not on any of these teams. Mm. I don't, I don't really spare the press either. I slap around my industry uh, with reckless abandon at these books <laughs> with apologies to any editors reading this. None of them are you. <laughs> yeah, exactly. None those of them are, are those you. I definitely made up because I like being employed. <laughs> 
<laughs> exactly, exactly. Uh, welcome to the conversation, Nancy and, and Jen. Great to have you both here. Um, Jane as well. Welcome, Kathy, Benjamin, Carol. So great to have you all. Thank you so much for joining. Sue, thanks for coming. Um, yeah, I think that I, I think my favorite thing about reading is the chance to walk in someone else's shoes through the pages of this book, to be in their lived experience, to see the world through their eyes and through their lived experience. And what an extraordinary opportunity that always is, but especially now when we're having this reckoning and this moment of both polarization and also greater understanding than I think we've ever reached before um, on both sides. So um James, what a perfect note to end on. Um, thank you so much for coming on tonight, joining us from LA for all of these, uh, this the, the inside scoop on both your life as a reporter and as a writer. Thank you, mystery and thriller fans, for joining us. And I will see you next Monday night for hashtag Mystery Mondays because you know Mondays can be murder. Have a great night, everybody. Thanks for having me. Bye.